Canada used to be a nice place to live, but that's no longer the case. Corrupt Canuck politicians are making life worse for Canadians in every way possible, dragging the country down into the mud with skyrocketing taxes, endless red tape, and authoritarian bureaucracy. In this video, we're taking a look at how we got here and the path to get out. Canada has plenty of problems, from the housing crisis to drug addiction, but there are specific areas where politicians are actively making the situation worse, high taxes that stifle economic growth, anti-business red tape and bureaucracy, authoritarian laws and Soviet-style policies. Let's start with Canada's tax nightmare. Canada has extremely high taxes that are much higher than most of the developed world. Start with Canada's personal tax on dividends of over 39%, for example, which is far above the OECD average of 24%. Then you come to capital gains. Canada hits capital gains with a tax of almost 27%, far past the OECD average of just over 19%. As for corporate taxes, Canada's rate of almost 27% is still considerably higher than the OECD average of around 23%. It only gets worse when you come to individual income tax. Hardworking Canadians are taxed at 15% when they make over $55,800 per year, rising to 20.5% when they make over $111,700, and rising steadily up to 33% income tax for those making over $246,700. This huge income tax burden is compounded by additional levies on virtually every purchase Canadians make. Disturbing reports indicate that, on average, Canadians surrender a staggering 60% of their earnings to the voracious appetite of taxes, including sales taxes, payroll taxes, property taxes, income taxes, and corporate taxes. This leaves a meager remainder for life's essentials after after grappling with utility bills, bank interests, and property taxes, encompassing federal, provincial, health, and sales taxes. The payroll tax alone gobbles up around 30%, while utilities constitute a significant monthly expense. Sales tax, whether in the form of GST, PST, HST, ranges from 5% to 15% on various purchases, further diminishing disposable income. Property taxes contingent on property value and insurance costs, varying by type and coverage, further contribute to the massive financial burden that Canadians are dealing with. For many Canadians, the leftover income for savings and spending on things they want in their life is very low after accounting for these substantial costs. Despite Canada's wealth in natural resources and mineral riches, the heavy taxation burden on citizens impedes their ability to thrive and contribute significantly to the nation's progress. Take just one example of a recent massive hike on property taxes in the far left-run city of Toronto. Toronto homeowners recently saw the latest budget from far-left Mayor Olivia Chow. It includes a massive 10.5% property increase, possibly rising to 16.5% unless more federal funds are received. This is a 9% rise from current rates. According to Toronto's budget chief Shelley Carroll, this could translate to an average annual tax increase of nearly $360 for Toronto households. Other areas in the greater Toronto area are also having hikes, including an almost 5% increase in Richmond Hill and around 6% increase in Milton. What are the chances that Chow will find a loophole to avoid the full weight of these taxes on her own properties? The far-left, big-government ideology that's eating up Canada is rife with hypocrisy and completely unsustainable. This brings us to the topic of the ridiculous red tape that's strangling Canada. Canada is full of big-government meddling and bureaucracy at every level, and it's strangling small business, construction, innovation, and returns on investment. Take the carbon tax as one egregious example of big government leftism that's harming Canada's economy. In 2019, Canada implemented a national carbon pricing scheme through the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, creating a policy that has become a central point of contention in the political landscape. The opposition conservatives under Pierre Polyev have promised to make it a focal point in the upcoming election, but so far, it's rolling ahead under Justin Trudeau. The policy consists of two main components, the fuel charge and the output-based pricing system. The first applies to a diverse range of fuels impacting consumers through a trickle-down effect in supply chains and indirectly influencing the prices of various goods. The second, output-based pricing system, targets larger carbon-emitting businesses, such as industrial companies and power plants, compelling them to pay a levy on a portion of their emissions. A carbon price is supposed to reduce carbon emissions by making fossil fuel consumption more expensive, thereby encouraging 
urging individuals and businesses to reduce their reliance on such fuels. The pricing structure starts low and incrementally increases over time, providing a transition period for consumers to adjust their habits. The ultimate goal is to make non-emitting alternatives more economically attractive, resulting in reduced emissions. As of now, British Columbia, Quebec, and the Northwest Territories have their own carbon pricing systems, while other provinces and territories utilize a combination of federal fuel charges and output-based pricing. Provinces must have their plans approved by the federal government. The cost per ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent is uniform across systems, starting at $20 and increasing annually until it reaches $170 in 2030. This pricing model aims to reflect the varying carbon footprints of different fuels. For instance, gasoline incurs a levy of about 14 cents per liter, while natural gas sees a charge of 12.4 cents per cubic meter. To reduce the financial impact on households, the federal government introduced carbon price rebates known as climate action incentives. Approximately 80% of households receive more in rebates than they pay in carbon pricing, with the remaining 20% compromising higher income households with larger carbon footprints, burdening specific demographics. Tracking the impact of carbon pricing on Canada's emissions proves challenging due to the myriad of climate policies in place and the difficult in quantifying behavioral changes. Even though Canada's federal government is trying to sweeten the deal by handing out rebates, all this money printing is only increasing inflation, not to mention that eventually Canada's economy is going to keep going downward the more the carbon pricing kicks in. Let's be honest, none of these policies are actually growth-oriented, and they are all aimed around a mentality of pressuring and forcing people into a specific, far-left green socialism view of how to run the world championed by individuals like Klaus Schwab and the Davos set who meet every year to scheme about the future they want to push through for the developed world. Lastly, we come to the disturbing authoritarianism that's slowly suffocating Canada under a woke rainbow quilt. From so-called disinformation laws to pushing a far-left gender ideology and legal drugs, Canada is slowly succumbing to what political scientist Sam Francis termed anarcho-tyranny. In this state of affairs, basic law and safety of citizens becomes increasingly ignored as mobs run wild and anarchy reigns, while prosecution of ordinary people on taxes, small infractions, speech codes, and policing beliefs gets ramped up. In other words, there is an over-vigilance on controlling and pushing down ordinary, productive citizens while simultaneously allowing lawless mobs to run wild. The worse things get on the streets, the more the centralized government uses it as an excuse to justify stricter controls on ordinary citizens, even though the ordinary citizens were not the ones causing disorder or violence in the first place. Canada and the United States are both falling into anarcho-tyranny, with criminal justice systems and a political class increasingly occupied by soft-on-crime woke individuals. How bad have things gotten? Retired Lieutenant General Michael Masonouve recently decried Justin Trudeau's woke agenda at the Conservative Party's convention, pointing out just how twisted Canada has gotten, with less and less housing for ordinary people and a complete lack of common sense policies, while far left gender issues, legal drugs, and woke virtue signaling is pushed at every level of government. Canadians want lower prices and a leader who prioritizes Canadian values, history, and greatness. But instead, they're getting inflation, gender ideology in the classrooms, carbon taxes, and government assisted death through Canada's medical assistance in dying or MAID program. While 500,000 new immigrants from every corner of the world are welcomed into Canada with very few economically useful skills, Canadians in trouble are urged to call a government hotline and end their life or wait hours at the hospital to get even basic medical care. Let's get down to brass tacks about Canada's political crisis. Canada's once pristine reputation as a utopia is rapidly diminishing. Plagued by a multitude of issues that span gender identity debates, contentious health care policies, soaring house prices, and an alarming tightening of census laws. This downward trajectory not only raises concerns about the nation's mental health, but also portends a looming economic crisis. The healthcare landscape in Canada has become a battleground, notably marked by controversial policies such as providing free and tested hard drugs to users as a safer alternative to illegal substances. While aimed at reducing overdoses and curbing drug-related crimes, the program sparks heated debates over taxpayer-funded illicit drug use, diverting attention from more significant issues, such as the erosion of free speech and individual rights. Censorship has become a growing concern, with Canada imposing restrictions on free
free speech within its borders and the government choosing to squash and censor what it calls disinformation from unrecognized media outlets who aren't friendly to the Trudeau regime. Rebel News journalist David Menzies was recently set up and arrested for asking a question of Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland in order to send a warning to all journalists unfriendly to the Trudeau regime that they will face legal consequences. The viral video of Menzies being assaulted by police for trying to ask a question has spread around the world, which is shocked by the level of Soviet-style intimidation and suppression going on in once-free Canada. The population, however, remains distracted by sensationalized topics, allowing the government to tighten its grip on information flow. This encroachment on free speech is exemplified by the control exerted over media, as well as the removal of news from social media platforms, compelling citizens to actively seek out reliable information online. The housing crisis in Canada further compounds its challenges. Skyrocketing house prices, outpacing salary growth, are diminishing disposable income, raising fears of an impending economic collapse. This economic strain, coupled with inflation and a lack of concrete solutions from the Trudeau government, fuels concerns about the overall state of the economy. As Canada steers towards a more woke approach, characterized by stringent censorship and an intensified control by Justin Trudeau, there is a risk of a mental health crisis and a real national breakdown. Rising anxiety, depression, and a fear of civil unrest are becoming pervasive, reflecting the societal toll of these issues. The controversial policies on gender-affirming treatment for minors have sparked cultural debates, yet the government's censorship of free speech seems to distract from more pressing matters. The housing crisis induced by stagnant wages and exorbitant living costs has led to increased homelessness and an inadequate government response. This deteriorating situation is exacerbated by a growing lack of freedom of speech and the escalating control wielded by Justin Trudeau. The country appears to be hurtling towards an economic crisis, prompting concerns about the potential need for a new leadership paradigm. As Canada grapples with these challenges, it serves as a warning to the rest of the Western world about the fragility of societal structures and the importance of addressing core issues rather than succumbing to distractions. If you like this video and want to learn more about what's really going on in Canada, check out this video here. And if this video brought value to you today, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing the video. Thanks for watching.